Hi, my name is John Canada Terrell, and you're watching Real Black. Lights, camera, action, it's on. New black film revolution born. Move with shakers, big and little filmmakers. Let's make a movie today, see where it take us. Halle Berry, Denzel, and Jane Lee. Terrence Star with Mike D and Spike Lee. Brand new filmmaker born every day. Put a camera in his hand and let him lead the way. I love films um, like Uptown Saturday Night, Piece of the Action, and Let's Do It Again. They were caper movies. There was an, uh, they were impossible. They were crazy situations, and against all odds, these these two guys that you love, the straight man and funny man, had to figure this thing out. And it was laced with all of these wonderful cameos from all these actors that you love. And so everybody always said, you know, we ought to remake this uh, piece of the action or, or Uptown Saturday Night. And I said, no, 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 let's, let's make an original one that just has some elements that feel like that. And so that's what I want to do. When you see the guys breaking into church and all that stuff, I mean, it just feels like you know this is not going to go well. We came here to get along. And I'm getting a massage. I want you to whisper your name in my ear. Mordecai. Ah! Every time these two best friends try to make a buck. Woo! What is this, man, pimp my wheelchair? They ended up busted. I ain't going to jail. Watch out! Ah! I've decided to forego any possibility of a jail sentence under the condition that you perform community service. I got Love no my problem community. With that. 5,000 hours! 5,000 hours! But when their lives go from bad to worse. I'm thinking about moving to Atlanta. You ain't taking my son nowhere. Listen, my lease is up on the shop. Unless you got $17,000, I gotta go. It'll take more than faith. Whoa. I'll let your church say amen. Hi, my name is Monica Peters, and we're here today with playwright and director David E. Tauber. David, how are you doing? Fine, fine. Feeling good. Feeling good. Well, welcome to Philadelphia. And we really, really, really enjoyed your film, First Sunday. So let the viewers know what the film is about and what inspired you to make the film. Well, you know, it's a, it's a uh, feel-good movie. A lot of fun. And, it's, and, you know, it's about two guys that uh, need to come with some money. So much so that they do the unthinkable. Uh, uh, unimaginable crime of, of robbing a church, okay. you know, only to find out that uh, they they they're in for a lot more than they expect. The church folk ain't, ain't 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 going down that easily. And this is like Club Jesus. They even got an open bar. Y'all got cheese whiz? We've raised two hundred and thirty thousand dollars. Say amen. I'm not robbing no church. When Darrell Jr. is in Atlanta calling something, dude, Daddy, don't be mad at me. They won't shoot the man. Get down, somebody got a gun. Now, what was it like working with Cat Williams and Ice Cube in this movie? Well, you know, Cat and Cube and Tracy, we were laughing on set every day, you know, because Tracy was doing stand-up comedy in between all the takes. What? I'm not climbing that the route? You crazy? I am not your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. My name ain't Peter Parker. I'm not climbing up that. And and Cat was 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 ad libbing jokes after he would do the things that were written. He would ad lib other stuff, and everything he ad libbed was so funny we would all fall out every time. Like what he said. This is not even my church. I saw this on MySpace. We <laughs> fell out, and then he told the girl, you know, when Ice Cube said he's gonna pop a cap, and he said, you don't have to worry about. It. You don't need that many bullets. <laughs> you know, I mean, he, he don't have that many bullets. You know, but it was just it was just fun. You know, it was a very fun, fun set. Yeah. Now, you're no stranger to the city of brotherly love. Was it important to you to make a stop here to promote your film? Yeah, you know, there, there, are, there are like 10 core cities for me that I, no matter what play it is, I always tour my plays. And Philly is one. It's one of my biggest cities for my plays. And, and a city I fell in love with, my wife and I. And, and you know, uh, I spent a lot of money, probably too much, on South Street on a lot of them stores down there. But uh, I always have a lot of fun here, and the people here are always very warm and real. Now let's talk about your career. It, it, it really spans over 15 years, uh, 24 NAACP nominations, five-time winner of the NAACP Image Award. Is there a difference between theater and film for you? Yeah, it was a big difference. You know, it's um, uh, it, 
plays, they're a writer's medium. You know, play the play is a writer's medium and film is a director's medium. So plays tell the story, film shows the story. So it's trying to marry those two, two together. But what I learned in stage uh, prepared me for film. Was it hard for you to make that transition or just totally normal and natural? Yeah, no, it wasn't hard. It was a natural progression, you know. Um, I, I, what, what I wanted to really focus on the film is performances, you know, because that's what we don't see as much in any cinema or, or performance in moments. You know, everybody is so fast to go from this joke to the next joke or this crazy moment to that crazy scene, but we, we don't ever stop a film, slow it down to breathe and have a moment, you know, so I wanted to, I wanted to make sure we had a lot of good moments in the film. Absolutely. Now, being that you've come from a theater background, and there's going to obviously be some comparisons to Tyler Perry. So from an insider's perspective, where do you see the future of uh, African-American films? Well, I mean, looking at his success and, and, and knock on wood, my success, you see that the people are telling folks what they want to see. You know, so often, for so long, it's been Hollywood programming what they think people want to see. You know, so somebody up in Hollywood, or some brother up in Hollywood, they ain't never been to Philadelphia, ain't never had the cheesesteak here, ain't never been to Broad Street, South Street, right. the Galleria, you know, none of that stuff. Um, but what we're showing now is that, uh, with our movies, is that people will tell you what they want to see. And people are saying, you know what, this stuff is funny to me. This is what I really want to see, not the other stuff they've been forcing me to see. You know, so I think the trend is, is, is giving people what they want and, and, and being in touch with real people, you know, uh, across America. And, and uh, I'm fortunate to be, you know, I'm fortunate to have this opportunity. What kind of name is Lee John anyway? My mother had two boyfriends, Lee and John. She ain't know who my real father was, so she named me Lee John. I don't think I would have told that. What's up, everybody? This is Lyra Speck reporting for Real Black, and I'm sitting here with raucous recording artist Hezekiah. How you doing today, Hez? Doing fine. How you doing? What gave you the idea for the title, I Predict the Riot? Um, I Predict the Riot was actually a Johnny Popcorn song. Johnny Popcorn is a is my rock band, so I sing in a rock band. Uh, Tony Whitfield is the producer of Johnny Popcorn. What up, Tony Whitfield? And also, it was inspired by, like, um, just like, Troubled team, because I was like a troubled team when I was younger. So looking at some of the talent that's come out of Raw, because you have your most staff and your Talib, right, right. um, do you feel a certain standard you need to rise to? Do uh -huh. you feel um, um, that your work needs to be of a certain caliber? Right, yeah, you got to at least match that. Match that? Yeah, at least match it or surpass it. If you don't match it or surpass it, you don't even need to be doing it. Keep hustling, I done seen it all. They used to talk shit, now I'm trying to be y'all. Say yo, it's better off getting a day job. The next day, they was cutting your lights off. Struggle did nowadays, that ain't the case now. Nah. What are listeners gonna feel when they listen to I Predict the Riot, and what type of place were you coming from with this album as opposed to your first album, Hurry Up and Wait? Okay, the first album, the first album was, was, was really a bunch of songs that I had, mm -hmm. and I just threw them together as an album. I feel you. I okay. Feel you. <laughs> <laughs> this album was, was more thought out conceptually. It was more thought out um, um, music-wise, okay. you know what I'm saying? And just, it's, it's kind of like a dark album, mm -hmm. but at the same time, it's an uplifting album. Um, it, it touches on certain subjects that, that may seem depressing, but it has a conclusion, like a, like a, like the, maybe the, it, the, the verses might be the drama, but the hook might be the conclusion or the uplifting, you know. So it has a chemistry. I understand that you recorded a lot of your album um, at your home studio. So what's the name of that studio? The studio is called um, My Damn Room. Are you serious? Because it's just it is just that. Is it know? literally? Yeah, literally. It's your just, damn. It's my it... room. Okay, so do you have like the egg crates and stuff? I don't as got the, the egg crates. I got my bed right there. Okay. Just okay. in case I got to work with some female artist. That's me. Just that's to, like, no, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Great. But Thank nah, you, no, no. Um, but 
Yeah. How did you get such a finished sound with the album? Um, what I do is reference mix. Okay. This is a tip for um, inspiring engineers out there. Um, reference mix, A, B, your mix. Um, play a CD that you like a mix of, go back, mix your kick, get it to sound like this, go back, mix your snare, go, go back, put your bass in the same pocket, compression as their bass, and just, you know, reference mix. That's how you get to learn, that's how you get an ear. Hmm. to what you like, you know what okay. I'm saying? If you like this type of mix, right. learn how to mix that type of mix. Okay. You know what I mean? Do you want to tell us what any of your reference mixes are? <laughs> uh, on this album, <laughs> not for real. On this album, okay. I'll tell you. On this album, it was like the Games album. Okay. Yeah, Doctor's Advocate. Cool, yep. cool. That's what's up. Yeah. Speaking of, you know, being in the studio and making beats, um, I understand that you're also a co-founder of the Beat Society. Yes, sir. Okay, tell us a little more about that. Uh, Beat Society is a producer-driven event made by producers for producers. We are a non-profit organization. That's why it is down right now. Um, Beat Society <laughs> started in 2002. Our original producers were Illmind, Kanye West, mm. um, Kev Brown, Street Orchestra, nice. Sat One, nice. um, and that was our like original producers like of Beat Society, and you know everybody since then got you know you know what Kanye's doing now. Right, right, um, right, right. You got um, Illmind signed to G Unit now. Okay, okay. And blah blah blah, so yada yada yada. What was but the overall goal of the Beat Society? Beat Society was just to expose up and coming producers. Put. Okay put unknowns on stage with names, okay, you know what I'm saying? Okay. And also to expose the people, expose to the people the art of beat making, that beat making, hip hop production is, is an art form. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, um, sample chopping is an art form. Um, so we give like, like for instance, we give all the producers, all four producers, four producers on stage, the same sample. And, um, and we, they, they chop it up. And it's just to show that you can give, I don't care how many producers the same sample, it's never going to be the same beat. Now, Hezekiah, there's a song on the album um, called Wild and Reckless, and mm. I was really affected by it because it seemed like a very personal piece yeah. um, for you. Um, what was going through your head when you actually wrote it, and what place were you coming from? Well, the first verse, I start the verse off, uh, words cannot express how I feel inside. I wrote this rhyme the same day that Dilla died. My man, so please excuse my man, it's part of me for rambling on. Sometimes I go off on a tangent. And that's the state I was in, like, I was just, like, I was just kind of fucked up because I just talked to, I just spoke to Dilla, like, it was, like, three weeks before that, you know what I'm saying? We were supposed to set up a beat society, um, um, Welcome to Detroit, um, in Philly, beat society, where, like, all Detroit artists, you know, Dwelle, Slum Village, um, Jay Dilla, um, you know, we, we was just set, going to set up this whole big beat society, Kareem Riggins on beats, Black Milk, JD, you know what I'm saying? Like, uh, Detroit, welcome to Detroit Beats. Anyway, so that's, that song was like, it really, you know, I was just in like a fucked up state when I wrote that verse. I learned layers from Dilla. I learned how to layer my beats from Dilla. Like just, just listening to how, how, how he fits certain sounds in certain pockets, like thinning sounds out, okay, you make the sound thinner, then you got more room for other sounds, you know what I mean? Um, I learned how to use my filter through Dilla. Um, certain tricks of Questlove was showing me that Dilla taught him. I learned, you know. Right, right. You know what I'm saying? Just, just right, right, like now, it's just right. crazy, man. Um, Cat, and and then the, then the humbleness on top of that. On top of that, like when I met Dilla, um, he was on some. You need some water? You know, right. yeah, 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 yeah. We like at, a, at an event. Like, you need some water? You know, yeah, 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 yeah. You cool? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like, like really, like on some real humble shit. There's two cats I know in the industry that's real humble, and that's like Will I Am and Dilla. You also have the collaboration with Bilal, uh, yeah. entitled "Looking Up," which right. is a really, in my words, a triumphant uh, a kind of piece. There, you know, mm -hmm. definitely to inspire. Because I've been struggling, struggling for too long. I'm looking for inspiration to live for sure I'm feeling it. Something's got give, I'm cursing these memories. Back when I was having thoughts of being suicidal, 15 stand down, my father's right. We saw um, Pursuit of Happiness. 
And the storm was inspired by the pursuit of happiness. And we was like, oh, we, you know, write something to be on, you know, if like we was to make a song to be on like the soundtrack or the lead, like the rolling credits at the end, like this was the song. But you know, that, that movie inspired this song, if y'all want to know. And uh, we shot the video in Brooklyn. And I actually shot the video for Wild and Reckless the day before the video shoot. And, and for, for looking up, I shot it the, the exact day before we shot that video. Um, I shot it in my, my house. Okay. I shot it in my living room with like a like a black sheet behind me, okay. and a lamp on both sides of my face, wow. and a camera in the middle. <laughs> There's a lot that goes on in this apartment. Yeah, this apartment is <laughs> like, like Wonderland. The studio, a video. It's like I'm on studio. house arrest. <laughs> <laughs> Last but not least, okay. where does Hezekiah see himself in five years? Um, I wanna, I'm gonna rule the world. <laughs> I'm not joking, that's not a joke. Oh, oh. Think that's what <laughs> my bad. I'm gonna rule the world. Um, whether it's it's production, you're gonna, see, you're gonna see my name on something. You can't, you're not gonna be able to get away from me in like five years. Whether it's film, production, um, movie scoring, anything. You know what I'm saying? I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be somewhere in your mass media household name has a guy. There's a whole generation of, of grown black people that have seen She's Gotta Have It, and for some strange reason, I still look like Greer. John, Canada, Terrell. So when they recognize me as Greer, they're like, oh my God, Greer Childs. And it's, it's amazing that a film could have um, that kind of sense memory in a people. In my experiences, I found two types of men. Whatever you want to do, I'll do. Wherever you want to go, I'll take you. The decent ones and the dogs. You so fine, baby. I drank a tub of your bath water. I kind of got on a fluke. Ruben Santiago Hudson, Lackawanna Blues. He um, was offered that role initially, and he had worked on stage. He was part of the Negro Ensemble Company with Tracy Camilla Johns. So in the, the final five minutes of we're getting ready to shoot, he declined. And uh, my name kind of came up, and uh, I got the script the very next day. Sure, I'll do it. Oh, I'm nothing like him. I, I, even at that point in my, my life, um, he was arrogant and very self-centered. If anything, I was aggressive. I was pretty self-confident, but I'm, I'm far too silly to have anything in line with where his character was coming from. You know, the minute you get fat, I'm leaving you. You know, if you weren't fine, I wouldn't even bother with you. Don't hurt yourself. In an independent film, well, you don't have a lot of film to begin with. You're shooting with one camera. So the onus is on you to, in one or two takes, capture the moment. But everybody's a little sensitive about, well, when are we gonna do the love scene? Well, let's not tell John. <laughs> and, and invariably, me and Tracy become rather tight because we're running lines together, we're hanging out together, and she's really cool. I like, she just had some kind of chutzpah that made her very unique and actually perfect for that role. So we're friends. But it's kind of like, oh my God, I got a love scene with you. So they wouldn't tell us when that love scene was coming. So when it finally came, it's like, oh my God, how do I act? And I'm kind of on the edge naturally. So they watch me, John, go, go, okay. <laughs> wow, she looks so good, my God. Okay, I'm, I'm with you. I think we did it in two takes. Tracy Camilla Johns. A rumor has it she, uh, she was quite popular because of that film. And then after New Jack City, uh, it just took her to another level just in terms of being the stunning black woman. I have a feeling she probably wound up um, marrying some top five pick in the NBA and she's got 3.5 kids and living in a mansion down in Atlanta or something. I just want to say thanks, fellas, for everything. Uh, and thank you for this gold album, A and B, and I hope we have the same success on my new solo album, Flash, It's Lonely at the Top, which will be in your record stores in about two weeks. You know, people look at these reality shows and they're watching entertainment tonight, and I look at it with a different kind of eye. One, I know a lot of these people, and I know what that fame thing will do to you, how it will take you to the edge, and if you're already on the edge, you gotta realize being an artist, 
you're not normal. <laughs> you're like this um, medium that can take in all these emotions and all these feelings and then throw it on a canvas and stand naked in front of the world and like, here, yeah, okay, I'm just, I'm just a tool for this. You know, and you give up the ghost. Now, the weird thing about it, I never really wanted to be a movie star. I wanted to be an, a working actor. I wanted to do film, I wanted to do TV, and I wanted to work with the best. And I was striving to be the best at my craft. So on that note, I wanted to attract that level of artistic uh, integrity and talent and work in multimedia. I want to jump from film to film, TV show to TV show. I want to be on stage, and, and I'm cool. That's all I wanted. Well, <laughs> there's a price to pay for that. You know, I, I had no game plan. I just wanted to work. But then I didn't know how to factor in what does it mean to be a sex symbol? How does that affect your life? It affected all my relationships from that point on. Because one, people think that that's really you. And then they're expecting that. And then they're in love with that character. Even if he's horrible. That's what they want. And that was, that was a little tricky. I'm like, my God, I can't be me. They want Greer. You know? Yeah, I did take a break in the year 2000. Uh, I found, um, I didn't enjoy acting anymore. Um, I had um, gone to a certain amount of success, I had just did two movies and a TV show and I was miserable. And then there was a death in my family, um, a long-term relationship ended. I'm like, wait a minute, I am not happy. So with all the things that used to make me happy, at least my career, I was a working actor, uh, it was not fulfilling anymore. So I just put everything on freeze. I stopped my life. I got out of that city. I came here to Philly to, uh, to the town where I was educated to just take a look at my life at it from a distance, from a different vantage point. And uh, I think initially it was an attempt to like, okay, I don't even like any form of fame or recognition. I don't like that right now. I just want to become introverted and just be nondescript. I found that impossible to do, even in moving here. So on that note, uh, in rediscovering the fact that I really love acting and getting healthier with it, uh, it wasn't until I hit the stage again I realized, no, this is what I do well and what I really enjoy is a live audience. And um, that's what challenges me and that's what got me into it. I did the Marvin Gaye story. It was a hit show. Uh, I'm very proud of it. I didn't realize that when once you get out of the East Coast and, and once you leave New York and L.A., there's a whole lot of America in between. So in going to Georgia and Florida, to Oakland, to Virginia, to North Carolina, to 10 states with this show, 17 cities, I realized I had a fan base and it was probably the most healing thing. And then I realized how old I was. We're talking about two and three generations. Like, yeah, I've been looking at you my whole life. Oh, thank you, little child. Oh, God, I'm old. But it was, it was wonderful, it, you know. Because I, I was used to working in front of a camera and I was getting no love back. I went on, on, on the road and got love. And so that's a great thing. Now I know I'm an actor. What would Greer be doing if there was a sequel? I have a feeling that um, human beings tend to, in relationships, kind of run into one or two people that have an effect on them particularly interpersonally, and I have a feeling that that particular woman left an indelible impression on him, and he probably stayed in denial and probably went to therapy about it and took it out on other women, but that was the one that got away, and, uh, and he messed with white women for a while, then went Asiatic, but uh, was always looking for another Nola Dolly. What am I doing now? I'm a griot. What do old actors do? They griot till they die. So that being the case, I'm a storyteller till I die. Um, what have I garnered from all my experiences that uh, I'd like to make my own films and then there's certain topics and, and subject matters I'd like to explore as an actor, as a producer, and then as a director. So on that note, that, that's where I'm at. Um, I have a heartfelt um, passion for a project called Gunrunner that I've been involved with for the last three years. Gerard Brown, who wrote Juice, he wrote Spawn, he's on HBO, uh, wrote it and uh, I've taken on the responsibility of trying to produce that film. I gotta give a shout out to my uh, business partner, Rick Morris, who was the writer and director of uh, White Men Can't Rap. Oh, I played a guy named Fleet Walker. I co-starred with uh, Clifton Powell, Pinky, 
who I was just on stage with uh, when we did the Marvin Gaye story. He played the daddy, I played Barry Gordy. It's a silly film. Silly. Four! Sometimes we do silly, you know. Silly's good. Act Spike Lee. <laughs> I think he opened a lot of doors, and a lot of people don't know that. So that's another reason why he should get some accolades and some love. Look at where we are now. Um, I Am Legend, number one box office. Gross out is $71 million, I think, thus far. Um, I think Denzel's movie is number three right now. Uh, Samuel Jackson's uh, films do rather well. Wesley Snipes has his own franchise. That was the beginning of the next renaissance in black filmmaking, and I'm proud to have been a part of that. It kind of, that was the next jumping off point. She's gotta have it, and everything else came from there. So yeah, from an historical point of view, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, take a look at it and look, for, look at where we are now. Wow. Having thoughts of being suicidal 15, stand down, my father's rifle burn Yeah, so please excuse me for my choked up delivery Eyes is tearing up, voices quivery My boy's telling me to show some dignity But my life keeps playing in my brain so vividly yeah, I hope my mother was right, told me choose work your love And you never work a day in your life, well mama It's Melly Mel's message stressing You don't know it cause I'm passive aggressive I'm losing weight cause I'm barely eating Something got happen cause my sneakers is leaning Plus my girl telling me she leaving So I'ma hustle these tracks I'm sick of barely breaking even I've been struggling for so long But something keeps telling me Keep on looking up